Yasmin Khan, Shwabani Basu, and Raghu Karnad. This session will be moderated by Nisid Hajari. Thank you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming out on a Monday morning. Thank, um, make sure that's working. Um, yes, as, the mo as she mentioned, we've got three wonderful writers here, all of whom have written on subject of war, World War I, World War II. Um, and this is a topic that traditionally has not been central to the Indian nationalist narrative for all sorts of reasons, one of which obviously is that there's been a, a emphasis on the whole philosophy of nonviolence as being the, the, the core ideal of the freedom movement. And it was a sort of inconvenient history to have these millions of Indian soldiers fighting for the Raj, but also fighting for India uh, at the same time. Um, but I think it's, it's arguable, and, and if you read these books, you'll see that the two wars transformed India at least as much as the freedom movement did. Um, and in fact, the British probably would never have left India in the way that they did at the time that they did, at the speed that they did, without the experience of, of these wars. Um, World War II in particular, made India a much more recognizably modern country. Uh, women found new freedoms in, in, in activism and in work. Uh, soldiers came back with new political ideas that they spread through letters and through conversations. And the British Raj, by the end of the war, was exhausted and was, was broke and really could not afford to maintain India as a colony anymore. Um, I think to, to help us unpack us, all of this, we have these, these three writers. I'm going to start with my left here. Shrabani Basu is a journalist and a historian and author of several books, including uh, Curry, the story of Brit Britain's favorite dish, and Victorian Abdul, the story of the Queen's closest confidant. Her newest book, uh, which you can uh, buy at the store, For King and Country, uh, sorry, For King in Another Country, very important distinction, sorry. Uh, uh, Indian soldiers on the Western Front from 1914 to 1918. Uh, next to her, uh, Yasmin Khan, is a professor at the University of Oxford, and you may know her from her wonderful book uh, about partition a few years ago called The Great Partition. Um, and her newest book is called The Raj at War, A People's History of the Second World War. And next to her, Raghu Karnan uh, has written a beautiful first book um, about uh, members of his family and, and their experience in World War II. It's called Farthest Field, an Indian Story of the Second World War. He is also a journalist and editor uh, and uh, has worked for both Outlook and Tehelka, uh, written several award-winning articles, and I hadn't realized this was editor of Time Out Delhi until 2011, so please welcome them. Thank you. Um, so I want to start chronologically. I want to start with, with Shrabani, if I, if I may. Uh, World War, uh, when World War I started, the Indian Army, the British Indian Army, was a domestic army. It, was, it had only fought on the subcontinent. It was used mostly to, to suppress the, the Pathan tribes on the Northwest frontier. And then suddenly it had to become this expeditionary force sent across the Blackwater to fight in the trenches of Western Europe. Um, and I imagine this transition was difficult and rough. You have a story, she has a story in her book about how uh, to, to combat gas attacks, the, the soldiers were told to to urinate in their turbans and wrap them around their face as, as a gas mask because they just were not equipped to deal with, with modern warfare. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how difficult that transition was. Well, uh, for the first time, uh, can you hear me? Is that okay? Yeah. So this, this war is the first time that the Indian soldiers were going to go and fight in the West. It is their first Western war. And one, what we don't know in this country is that 1.5 million cross these black waters, the Kalapani, uh, the forbidden seas to go for this war. And it's the first time that they are fighting shoulder to shoulder with their Western counterparts. So the Tommy, uh, the working class Tommy, is fighting with the, you know, the soldier, the peasant soldier from India. And um, unfortunately, we know nothing about them because the, the overlasting impression we have is of the, of the First World War, is the Tommies with their helmets in the trenches. And as I was growing up in India, I had no idea that there were men in turbans in these very same trenches. There were Sikhs, there were Pathans, there were Garwalis, there were, um, you know, Dogras, there were Rajasthanis. And it was, a whole, it was a whole different structure because it wasn't even just the soldiers. When the, Indi when the British took these forces, there were the Maharajas on one hand, you know, saber rattling, ready to go to war. And on the other hand, because you were taking the Indian army, you had Hindus, Muslims, and you had to, the logistics were absolutely, uh, you know, really a nightmare. 
because Hindus wouldn't eat, uh, you know, beef, the Muslims wouldn't eat pork, they had to have separate things. So along with them marched a huge army of followers, the cooks, the cleaners, the sizes, and uh, this, I call them the Bandra brothers who went all together for this first Western war. So the logistics were a nightmare, but it all worked in the end. I mean, we'll, we'll go into the, the other yeah, stories. I mean, as you were saying, as they had know. to learn how to do everything differently, how to make chapatis in, in the trenches, yes. how to separate. <laughs> Uh, both how you dealt with the dead and how you, how you dealt with Everything. the living. Everything. They had separate religious facilities for Hindus and Muslims. Uh, they had separate water carriers uh, to give the water. They had, it's the first time that curries reached the trenches. They had chapatis, they had the cooks making the chapatis, taking them in, you know, hot food. And these cooks would be killed in the trenches. There are, you know, there are so many graveyards with just the names of the cooks. One name, Hansa. Cook, Babu, Cook, they don't even have a second name. So for me, it was these stories, you know, where did they come from? Why, how did they land up there? What did they feel? And there is a, a story I might go into later, you know, before I take up too much time, about a cleaner, Sukha, which mm. I might come into later. Okay. All right, we'll come back to him. It's a great story. Um, um, so he was a cleaner who went to the war, yeah. yeah. So let me, let me skip ahead a little bit to, to Raghu. Um, the 20 years later, after the end of the First World War, um, Second World War obviously is starting. But at this point, the beginning of the First World War, Gandhi had not even returned to India yet. You had no real mass nationalist movement. At this point, 20 years later, you've had these great uh, civil disobedience campaigns. The idea of fighting for the Raj was more, was more complicated. But in your book, you really do bring out almost the sort of romance and adventure of signing up for, for this overseas war. Um, among a certain class, not, not everyone, right? Some other people were forced into, into yeah. recruitment. What was the attraction? What was, what was it that drew people to this? Well, one of the, one of the things that makes the Second World War d sort of pr fundamentally different from India's experience of the First World War, and also transformative for the country and for the army over the long run, it sort of was the point at which India's modern army, the army we have today, was formed was that the pressures of the war effort, this global deployment of this rapidly in expanding Indian army, allowed and required in young Indian men, um, and in, in fact women as well, to be recruited not just into the ranks as they always had been, but also for the first time in large numbers into the officer corps, so into positions of command. So this, was, this really sort of uh, subverted, this was very subversive to a key principle of the design of the army of the Raj. Uh, and it had v many important consequences after the war was done. But so I, I sort of approached the history of the Second World War as, I, as it unfolded for me, as I, as I explored the personal stories of this young family. And this family is my family. They're uh, young Parsis and Kodavas, which means people from Kurg in, in what's now Karnataka in the 1940s. And they were, they were this sort of relatively new, they belonged to this relatively new middle class. Uh, that middle class would not have ever dreamt of, of joining the army or of participating in the war. And their fates would have been largely separate from the war had it not been for the fact that for the first time, especially after the sort of doldrums of a global recession in the 1930s, for the first time, the, the, British, the Indian army had thrown open its gates and was offering them commissions as officers. It's, very, it's, it's, it's difficult to overstate what a significant event this was. For the first time, if a young Indian man was to be inducted as a, was, uh, as a lieutenant in the Indian army um, and marched past and was walking past a, a British NCO in his cantonment, a white man would have to salute him. These were unthinkable changes uh, for the country and for the army. So each of the, uh, each, of the, each of the characters in my story who does end up in the war ends up because of slightly different motivations and circumstances. Not all of them are motivated by the glamour or the martial spirit. Um, one of them, for instance, joins the fledgling Indian Air Force, which for the first time expanded beyond more than just a token, uh, you know, a, any kind of just token strength. But certainly, as uh, in the larger picture, one generalization you can make is that there was both a really valuable opportunity and a great um, promise of glamour and status available to Indian men, mm -hmm. young Indian men from the middle class, for the very first time by playing a role in the Indian Army and in the Second World War. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, it, and also, I mean, just the character of the army changed, right? I mean, before in World War One, your family would have been what what British commanders called part of the the effeminate peoples of the South, right? <laughs> they they weren't the martial races of the North that, that made up the bulk of the fighting men. They would never even have been recruited before, uh, previously. So. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the I, I often get the question, what on earth are you doing, or, or how did you come to write a book about the Second World War or about the Indian Army and have it located in South India and involving sort of all these Parsis and Malayalis? <laughs> surely that's just, you know, surely that's just dissonant and, 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 you, and uh, it ought to be about Punjabis and Jats and, mm -hmm. and Pathans. And uh, it's just, uh, I mean, well, obviously, if you wanted to make a story, if you wanted to write a story that was most characteristic or most representative of the largest number of people, it's possible that you would need to locate it somewhere in, the, um, in, in a community, you know, you'd need to start somewhere in a community in the Northwest. Uh, though it's also true that, a, that the second to largest uh, um, zone of recruitment over the course of the Second World War ended up being the Madras presidency after, uh, you know, after uh, Punjab. What, so for me, it was interesting because not only because the, the private experiences of this family and of these young men uh, signified how different things were from before, yeah. uh, that they would never, that, that you know, you'd, even, even today when we look back at, uh, at the character and the sort of, and, 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 and the assumed history of South India, that we, we don't, you don't have the impression that war has played a role on that society in, in recent decades or even in recent centuries. Um, but it has, not just in the fact that many, many people from South India of various uh, castes and classes and uh, genders um, went off to serve in the world wars and in the Second World War especially, but also in the fact that the world war arrived very close and, and made and came very close to visiting South India itself. Right. Another right. thing that we forgot. Yeah, yeah. the Japanese bombing. Yeah, please. I, I just wanted to add on recruitment because I think what, what Rabbi's saying is absolutely right. But even further down the ranks, away yeah. from the officers, yeah. there's a complete transformation also of the base of, of who is coming into the army. Those old martial races, those recruitment grounds, are, are suddenly stripped of men almost completely. And, and the army's need for men is so great that yeah. they're spreading their net wider and wider all over the country. And you have men whose families have no particular tradition of, of military links coming in because they want to get away from marriages that they're not happy about, they've had rows with their parents, they're seeking adventure, or they really want a, f a full belly and they want regular Sakari kind of state employment and pay. So you have this kind of real transformation of the army at every level, I think, because, yeah. um, because, of, the, because of the war. And that, that really changes that uh, earlier kind yeah. of settlement that had been there with the colonial state. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's fascinating, in fact, that, that there was this level of, of crisis. The, the Indian army expanded um, by a scale of 10 yeah. between 1939 and the end of the war from just up to two and a half million people. Um, I may as well get this, okay. this figure out of the way. <laughs> it, is the largest, uh, it, it was the largest non-conscripted uh, army in, in, in possibly in human in, history. In history. Yeah. So uh, the, the level of sort of, I, I would say, one might even say an existential crisis that applied to the army at that point because it had to grow, it had to be modernized, it had to be equipped better and better, but at the same time there were people um, including the, the then Prime Minister Churchill, who, un, who feared and were paranoid and also perceived that that was going to make it, a, correctly perceived that it was going to make it a less effective instrument of British imperialism in the long term. Though it, though it was necessary to make it a much more effective instrument for the defense of the empire in the short term. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, yes. oh, sorry, sorry. No, and what I was going to say is, uh, uh, talking about the recruitment, first time that the women come in, which Yasmin has talked about, and first time which I focused on is a, is a, secret, a woman secret agent in the Second World War, yeah. who I've written about, Noor Inayat Khan, and this is the first woman who goes out, parachuted into Paris, uh, does you know wonderful work, is awarded the George Cross, and is killed by the Gestapo. So daring work being done by women, and uh, Yasmin, you'll add to this about women in the ambulances. Not just the, yeah. not just the army, right? The, yeah. the, the, yeah. the war transformed lives for women 
yeah. civilians yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think women's lives within the army were transformed because there was the recruitment of a women's auxiliary force India that people really forget about. But women were able to be aircraft plotters. They were nursing, of course. They were um, able to take part in, in stenography. They were working in the offices. So some women who had been in the home were finding new employment, working outside of the home. But I think as a generation, and that comes across in Raga's book too, is that there's this young generation who are coming of age in the 1940s, mm -hmm. and they're quite different to their parents' generation. They, they're seeing different things at the cinema, they want to have new experiences, and the war offers possibilities of transformation and change in a way for yeah. them. And I think that, that really kind of is something. But I think there are, there are women's lives in the Raj also, um, British women's lives, who, women who've been sort of in colonial bungalows, um, just sort of holding tea parties, who are suddenly you know, um, nursing, wearing nursing. uniform, or mm -hmm. uh, um, on the front line even, uh, helping bring back injured soldiers from Burma and... And, and, from and dealing and with Indian soldiers And, for the and first nursing time, right? Indian soldiers as yeah. well, for, yeah. the first, for, the, for the very first time. First and that, of course, <laughs> is, is also controversial. Right. So, mm -hmm. so there's this, this kind of um, social change happening at every el order of society. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, on yeah. every yeah. class and... Uh, that, I think that really is what made, makes, I think probably for all three of us, what makes the stories of these world wars so tantalizing is not just because of their sort of global strategic or military significance or because of what it meant, signified about what yeah. was going to happen in Delhi, mm -hmm. but because this level of mobilization and violence uh, and industrial sort of um, industrial conflict happening in the world just had just produced ripples of all kinds of change that went all over the country to yeah. different classes, which Yasmin's book is so great at, at highlighting. And, to lab and you know, women is a good way to, to note it because it's more, it's more plain to see that men, uh, men's lives would be transformed by direct recruitment and by more factory jobs and so on. But all of that, uh, women being a little bit one step further from the public sphere, at least the formal public sphere, is just as interesting, uh, is, is just as illuminating. And one of the, maybe my favorite character in, in my book is, is a woman, it's actually my grandmother. And uh, to, to follow her and to see how her life became, uh, the, the, the mobility and the autonomy and the, uh, that, 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 she, that she sort of uh, obtained during those years and how closely twinned it seemed to be to how, every, how much everyone was moving and how much the whole country was sort of uh, out of order. Yeah. And, uh, was I, really I think, and I think that applies on both the sort of nationalist side, if you like, those who are involved yes. in the Congress movement or, and, and other aspects of the freedom movement, and, and on the side of those who are involved with the military, because yeah. there's a sort of parallel there. That in the INA, you have women taking a part, exactly. and um, mm. uh, women like Aruna Asafali, who are in the Quit India movement, and going underground and uh, marrying as they wish and uh, doing all these things that they might never have been able to do in the past, you know, mm -hmm. hold, having their own sort of power. Um, and, but it's paralleled on the, on the other side, I think, with families who are also able to access, uh, women who are able to do new things because of the war and able to work, able to earn, earn their own money and maybe able to have some more freedom and choices yeah. through that. No, it's, as you say, it's important to remember that the, the leadership of the nationalist movement was in the jail throughout the yes, entire war. Yeah. So the space was opened up for other people, for women and yeah. uh, activists. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, someone like Aruna Asafali is interesting because she wasn't imprisoned mm -hmm. in 1942 because she wasn't seen as a top level, you know, the top level cadre of the Congress leaders were, were, were imprisoned. Right. But actually what that meant was that some of their wives <laughs> and some of the women were able to sort of step into their shoes. And during the Quit India movement, they, were, they played a more prominent mm -hmm. role whilst their husbands were behind bars. And one of the interesting dynamics, in, I think, in my book is between Aruna and her husband. Mm. And he's in jail, and he's sort of very worried about the violence, very worried about what's going on during the war. He's kind of desperately depressed and concerned, and he's, he's locked up with Nehru and the others in Ahmadnagar. And at the same time, his wife is, is sort of wearing disguises and hopping on and off <laughs> trains and hiding out and on the run and has a, has a sort of big prize on her head from the police. And so the, the, the dynamic is completely um, yeah. changed and inverted in a way. She, she becomes the one and of course their marriage doesn't survive it because uh, by the end of the war they, they, they go their separate ways. And he becomes the first ambassador to the, to the, to the Washington, US. Washington, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah.
No, but, so but that fact that divorce and, and, and yeah, those yeah. kinds of disruptions also seem to have a part in, this, in, the, mm. in that yeah. particular yeah. point in history. And the person, the sort of counter, a good counterpart to Aruna Asafali is obviously Lakshmi Swaminathan, yeah, yeah. who, yeah. Was, uh, who left yeah. Madras and, and has a sort of brief cameo in my story, but left Madras and went to Singapore and found herself there at the point that Singapore fell to the Japanese. And, um, and eventually became a, a sort of a great devotee and a great supporter and a leader in Bose's army. Uh, and yes. of course, part, part, of, part of her story is also uh, just not, not staying in that marriage, I suppose. I don't know very much about the personal aspect of it, but she became the leader of what was probably the first armed uh, regiment of all yes. women soldiers, uh, combat soldiers in, um, in the modern era in India. Yeah. I think the other thing was education, actually, which filtered down. It was when the soldiers went for the First World War for the first time, many of their letters, you know, they're writing that, you know, the West is educated. We need to go back and educate our women. Look at the French women. Look at how they work. And in fact, one of the, one of the characters in my book, he's the Ran Singh Negi. He's awarded the Victoria Cross. And when the king asks him, what do you want? Um, all he says is, I want a school to be built in my village. In, in Garhwal. It's in the remote hills of Garhwal, and that's all he wants. And the British do build that school. So I think education then also, you know, the importance of education, and then it all works towards the liberation as well. So they, at the grassroots, they are, they know that they need to educate the people. And, and, and there's a lot of cost for women as well, of course, and, and you see that in Raghu's book with the, just the, the waiting for women. And, and I, I write also about these women who are waiting years without letters, mm. you know, often not hearing from their men who are away in mm. Burma or in Italy or North Africa, and they're waiting, they're, they're waiting on letters, they don't know what's happened to their men. Mm. And uh, there are also you know, women who are sending two, three, four sons, and yeah, okay. there are even medals. The British award a medal to any woman who gives more than two or three, I think, sons to the to the to the army. Yeah. And they they often, you know, in villages, women are having to do harder work. They're having to take that place of the men in the fields, um, do double the work that they might have had to do before. And so there's a kind of cost as well. I think you know it's hard. It's a hard time. In fact, sorry, talking about women. There's this uh, Saturi, who is uh, the wife of one of the Victoria Cross awardees, uh, Gabar Singh Negi. Her story always moves me so much. Uh, she's illiterate. She was 14 when her husband, who's 22, dies in the Battle of Neuve Chapelle. He's awarded the Victoria Cross, and this is sent to her. She can't even read the inscription behind it, but she pins up the Victoria Cross on her sari, and she wears it all her life. And her family said she never remarried. She lived in 1981. She used to go collecting firewood, walking in the forest, and everybody would salute her because they were saluting the Victoria Cross. And till 1981, she stood there and took a salute um, every year uh, for a memorial for uh, Gabar Singh Negi. So I think it's these little yeah. stories of the women. Uh, so, uh, sorry, sorry Nisim, yeah, we're, no, not we're not letting you do <laughs> Thank you my job. <laughs> job all, we're too excited here. <laughs> this, too is, this is a really good subject. It's such yeah. an integral subject for, for this. I mean, the, the role of women is such an integral subject. And one of my favorite little discoveries was, uh, was a little editorial. I just want to read a few lines. Of course. I think it's mm -hmm. fun. My, the central character in my book, his name is Bobby, and he's an engineer who eventually joins an engineering regiment in the army. Uh, but he's studying at the College of Engineering in Gindi, near Madras, uh, and, and graduates in 1942. So Gindi is the oldest engineering college in India, but 1942, that, that graduating class includes the first two lady engineers, quote unquote, um, in its history. And they wrote an editorial in the college magazine, which I was thrilled to find and say, seems to say, say all of this best. Um, and what they wrote, their names were A. Lalita and Leela George. And what they wrote was, the present war has brought the fight to our doors. And when our men are up in the air, keeping back the enemy, um, and he, the enemy, comes under cover of darkness and bombs factories and does not spare hospitals, churches, or schools, it is a war of the machines, and the latter have to be produced by the stay-at-homes, namely women. How can we produce machines if we do not know the science of engineering? Large numbers of women have been recruited for driving motor vehicles and piloting aeroplanes. In peacetime, we are only typing automatons, living components in the telephone exchange, showcase mannequins, or dancing marionettes. 
but the war has compelled men to give us more urgent and important places in handling machinery. Gifted as we are with equally sized brains, can we not learn about the principles of machinery and take our place as engineers in charge? Hmm. So, I mean, I think it must have... I think just writing that editorial took more courage than we probably uh, yeah. Yeah. can quite perceive at the moment, and yeah. so yeah. there's a yeah, exactly. picture exactly. behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Talk a little bit, any of you, uh, you know, militaries in general, historically, have been forces for integration and inequality within the ranks between races, between castes and creeds. How did the experience of these wars transform relations between Hindus and Muslims, between different castes, between Indians and, and, and their British officers and, and fellow British soldiers? I don't know. Okay. Do you want to start with it? Yeah. Okay, first of all. Yeah. Um, right. Well, I followed the story of uh, three generations, actually, mm -hmm. on both sides, Indian and British, and this is a friendship formed in the, in the trenches. So there's Manta Singh, he's from the 15th Ludhiana Sikhs. He leaves for the war with his captain, uh, Captain Henderson. And uh, they're in the Battle of Neuve Chapelle, and uh, it's one of the bloodiest battles that happens uh, in 1915. And um, he finds his captain injured. So without a thought, he goes there, picks him up, and puts him in a wheelbarrow, and is taking him back. And this is under heavy shell fire. So Manta Singh gets a bullet in his leg, and uh, well, both get back to the trenches. Uh, but Manta Singh is very injured. They take him back to a hospital. Story is Manta Singh dies. Uh, Henderson, the captain he rescued, survives. But it doesn't end there because Henderson, George Henderson says, Manta Singh gave his life for me. So he makes sure after the war that Manta Singh's son, Asha Singh, uh, gets a job in the, same, uh, in the same regiment. And then George Henderson's son, Robert, and Manta Singh's son, they go together to fight in the Second World War. I think they fight in El Alamein in Africa. And of course, the family are friends. And I met the third, the grandson of Manta Singh, in, um, in, who lives in England now, and the grandson of uh, Robert Henderson, Ian Henderson. And they both, they're old men in their 70s. They wear their grandfather's medals. They are the loveliest men, I can't tell you. And they go together to this chhatri in Brighton, which is a memorial for Indian soldiers and they lay a wreath together. So th these stories of friendship, you know, formed in this battlefield um, and over generations is lovely. <laughs> well, I, I think it's one of the tragedies of partition and it's one of the lesser understood tragedies of partition is how the army is disentangled and, and how mm. these, this very well integrated and, and very mixed and uh, kind of coherent force was, was segregated out and there's some very touching stories of parties given at the last minute as, as, as troops are being segregated out and sent across from one side of the border to the other. And I think there's a, there's a, a real sense, I think, that this separation is going to take a very long time. I mean, Claude Auchinleck, who's the commander-in-chief of the Indian Army at the time of independence, he says, oh, well, we c you know, he's told by Mountbatten we've got to segregate the army. And he says, well, we could do it in about five years. And of course, he's got a, a matter of, of months to do it. So I think that that kind of process is, is immensely painful. And um, before that, especially when they're on the front line, especially right. when they're facing the enemy, right. these kind of divisions of caste, religion, just race, just and it, it seem to kind of dissolve. Yes. Before that, I mean, the, the, the big question, of course, is that relationship between British officers and men and how yeah. that is all, all, all managed. And I think... Um, for every story of friendship and amity, there's also stories of slights and of, of, of salutes not given and of little uh, little barbs and right, right. things like uh, like that. But I think people there did start to the, the war does change that kind of proximity of going through that that immense experience yeah. of fighting. It kind yeah. of dissolves a lot of those those differences. Yeah. And there's a story, a lovely story of a, a, a cook who's a, who's, he's called a BT cook, he's a British troops cook, <laughs> and he's from Lucknow, and um, the, the British officers decide that they'd like to in, eat the Indian food as well, but he's refusing to cook <laughs> chapatis and things because he says, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm meant to be making omelets, and the, right, um, right. No, they have to kind of coax them right. into <laughs> cooking the Indian food for all the officers. Yeah, the complexity of this moment is, 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 really, is really interesting. For instance, it wasn't always the, the way racism and the assumptions of what, which race belongs where uh, worked out wasn't always what you would think. It wasn't always uh, simply um, white men in the, uh, in the officer's mess mm. sort of uh, holding, um, holding Indi new Indian, young Indian officers at arm's length or anything like that. 
frequently what you keep hearing about is Indian um, NCOs, Indian VCOs. Mm -hmm. So uh, these these are sort of the the top ranks of the enlisted uh, of, of, of the enlisted troops, who didn't who were very unhappy to be serving Indian lieutenants. Their assumption, their entire training, and their, their, and, and and these were men who would, if you're a Jamadar or a Subadar, had spent many years in the service of the army of the Raj, was that their role was to serve a, um, a sahib. Mm -hmm. And the idea that it was now a brown man who was, uh, who was, who was going to be lieutenant some, sometimes was resisted as much by them as by anyone else. Um, but yeah, the war changed everything. It's really, it's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a, that's something that makes it so striking for me that we don't know the histories yeah. of these wars because the histories of these wars uh, are the history of the modern Indian army, of the army that we have today, mm -hmm. um, and in many ways of, uh, they're, they're sort of critical to the history of I think more Indian society. For instance, the the army of the Raj was in many ways designed uh, as a response. Its fundamental principles were, were put in place as a response to what happened in 1857. So, in the at, at points that there was not a world war in progress, the Indian army was in uh, in every way possible, wherever possible, it was the, the divisions between castes and classes and religions was reinforced. Uh, correct me if if uh, if you think that I'm no. simplifying this, Yasmin. No, but no. Um, so I'll give you an example. the The unit that my main main character Bobby eventually serves in is a very small unit. It's an engineering field company. It only has about 200 enlisted men and five officers. But even within that within that field company, which which has three platoons, one platoon is Sikh, one platoon is Punjabi Muslim and one platoon is Hindu. And this pattern of, uh, of segregating communities reproduces, it's sort of like a fractal at every level of the organization of the army. The idea, which was laid out very soon after 1857, was that in the event of a mass, a mass in, uh, insubordination, that Hindus could be made to fire at Sikhs, Sikhs could be made to fire at, him, uh, at Muslims, etc. quoting somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the war and the pressures of the war on this, on this sort of regimented um, and, and sort of uh, cleanly divided army that caused a lot of those divisions to, uh, uh, to, to, be, dif to be diluted because, you just, because people had to just be put in, reinforcements had to be brought into regiments all over the place. Indians were now in the, um, uh, in the commanding ranks and white men were often uh, serving below them as warrant officers and NCOs. And, um, and, that's, and so the Indian Army was beginning to become, for almost for the first time, a, a much more inclusive, yeah. much more national, nationally, uh, an army that reflected the uh, picture of the country mm -hmm. in, in, yeah, a, in a much better mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one, of, that's one of the reasons that it was such a tragedy that partition followed mm -hmm. so fast on the yeah, heels of it. I wanted to ask uh, Yasmin about that, because something yeah. you said, the, the violence of partition, mm -hmm. the, these terrible riots that happened, some historians would argue that this is an extension of World War II, that, yeah. that it was the aftermath, the demobilization of these soldiers, the experience that many Indians had had of, of carnage, of being bombed, uh, that, that fed into the violence. I mean, do you see a relationship Well, I, I think what we see throughout the 1940s as a byproduct of the war is, is a militarization of society as well. Um, you know, there are more and more arms around. There are more and more uniforms around. There are more and more um, kind of groups springing up, okay. which are militias, uh, semi-organized groups. And um, the Congress's uh, non-violent kind of non-violence is starting to kind of break apart a little bit. Gandhi doesn't have the authority in the 1940s, perhaps, that he had in the 1930s. I mean, he, of course, he, he recaptures it magnificently at partition, and, and he really uh, then is, is, you know, absolutely sort of there and central to everything, but I think there's that, there's that sort of moment in the 1940s when the Congress are behind bars, yeah. and there's a breakup of, um, of, of order, in a way, in society, because the colonial state is, is, is trying to fight this war, mm -hmm. and is struggling, actually, to keep a hold of all sorts of other, th uh, you know, struggling to keep a hold, and people are fed up. The, the, the Quit India movement is essentially a, a, a reaction to, to years of, of repression and uh, to years of, of trying to yeah. keep a, a nonviolent 
mass movement on, on track. And, and so I think um, partition, you know, is, is there's, there's a, a huge influx back into India of demobilizing men who are coming back from the wars, coming back from the fronts. They think we've been fighting for our country. Where's the independence that we've been fighting for? And mm -hmm. um, they're often being well armed, well trained. And, um, and then there's a vacuum of power in the country. So I think there is a connection, and more and more historians are showing how there is a connection, perhaps between partition violence, um, and especially in Punjab, and, and, and demobilization and, and sort of demilitarization demilitar right. at, at that time. Right. And of course, the INA men come back to this hero's welcome right. as well. So there's this sort of celebration of violence in a way that there had never been right. before in the Indian nationalist movement uh, prior to that. And I think it's, it is sort of, it is of a piece with the fact that it's a time, it's a time of war. You know, I think partition is, a, is, a, is it's not surprising in a way, it's tragic and, and uh, terrifying, but it comes on a continuum, if you like, of, a, of, a, of years of, of violence that have already preceded that through, um, through the 1940s. Right. You know, it's interesting that you say that the Hindus and Muslims after, you know, they've come trained, because after they return, they fought in the trenches in the First World yeah. War, and they come back, and then within months of them coming back and the war ending, you have, they were expecting dominion status and you know, the things to be given to them. Instead, they have the roll attacks, yeah. which is stopping congregation. And there's a, lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of protests in Punjab. And the Hindus and the Muslims, uh, they actually drink from the same cup to show the British government. They so said, we drink from the same cup. We fought together in the trenches. And they're opposing the British government. And then, of course, Jallianwala Bagh happens which is within five months after the Sikhs have uh, given, you know, most of the recruitment in the, in the First World War is from Punjab, is from the Sikhs. And then Jallianwala is like this slap on the face, you know, forget it, you, you did all this and this is what you get. And uh, immediately there's no turning back. I mean, this is, as you say, you know, this is when it all is, sort of goes up, you know, well, it goes into fourth yeah. gear and it just moves up from there. The nationalist movement happens and, um, they have bombing of, um, which I didn't know, they actually had aerial bombing of uh, villages of Punjab. And there's a pilot, there's a young pilot who's the first Indian pilot, who's Hardit Singh Malik, he's a dapper young Sikh. And he's flown these planes, he's gonna get married on Baisakhi, and he describes it as the darkest day of his life. And then he watches the same planes bombing these villages in Punjab. So you can imagine the sort of reaction this then has on the people. No wonder, you know. And it just steps uh, up. Sorry, and I don't, I don't actually want to take it down this route, but in mm. light of current events and what's dominating the global headlines today, uh, the Khilafat movement, the, the, the decision of the British, uh, of the British to uh, abolish the office of the Caliph um, mm. was another kind of, act of great betrayal. I, I, mean, I don't know how much Indian Muslims personally felt this, how much this was Gandhi's uh, interpretation, but... Um, it, this, these were Muslim troops who had served the British and gone and fought uh, an Islamic sort of empire and felt, it, I think, uh, you broadly felt enormously betrayed by the fact that the British had, had used their labor and their, mm -hmm. um, their valor in order to just uh, yeah. to eradicate the, the main Islamic authority from, okay. from the world. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, as you point out in your book also, after World War II, there was something similar where the British asked Indian troops to suppress, not Indian nationalists, but in Vietnam and in Indonesia, they were sent to, to, to put down insurgencies by local nationalists. Yes. Uh, yes. You know, this is their immediate reward for having fought for Britain was to go. Was, to, yeah. uh, to, to I mean, I think that links to the point around partition as well. The, the end point of the war in India is not that clear because you know, there is, there's, there's victory in Europe day, but what does that mean in Asia where the war is still going on with Japan? Then you have, then you have VJ Day, Day, but um, India is still, uh, can, there are still Indian troops across in Malaya and in For Singapore, as far as Japan, they're all over the, the Southeast Asia, right up until 47, 48, you know, and so um, it, that there isn't an, such a clear end point as perhaps the celebrations and the memorializations sort of always pin it to a specific date, but right. I think in reality a lot of people's lives were far less clear than that, and yeah. soldiers, families were still waiting to hear news from their soldiers, wondering when they were going to be demobilized. And just demobilization took such a long time. So many men, so little shipping space, you're waiting to put men back onto ships and yeah. trying to transport them, and so lots of people just uh, taking a lot longer to get home than, than we often think. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, uh, in November of last year, I spent an evening sort of mulling on the fact that uh, 
after a number of, of, of fairly large commemorations and, 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 and uh, celebrations of the 70th anniversary of VE Day, of VJ, Victory Over Japan Day, um, that particular evening was the 70th anniversary of a battle in which Indians had played an enormous role and which many Indian soldiers had died, which was for certain one that no, what, nobody would want to remember, um, uh, which is called the Battle of Surabaya. And what happened in that situation was that the Japanese army had surrendered. According to the terms of surrender, they would hand over all of their arms and the territory to, uh, to, to allied forces. And they would, they would, part, they would um, cooperate in the, re in the restoration of, the, um, of European colonial rule in places like Java and Sumatra and Malaya. Of course, not all Japanese soldiers uh, thought, thought well of this arrangement, and they handed over their troops to local nationalists who decided that they were now going to be free, that they weren't going to go back under Dutch rule because Holland itself had only just come out of occupation a few months earlier. So what's the solution to this? The Indians, under British orders, fighting on behalf of the Dutch, <laughs> go to Java to fight Indonesi Indonesian nationalists armed by the Japanese. And this is the real final chapter of the Second World War. It has very little place in, um, in certainly in the, in the popular narrative of the war at all, and you can see why. because. It, it, it puts the war in, um, in a continuum with, uh, with imperialism, which is where it actually belongs, with, with the longer history of imperialism. We like to think of the Second World War as a period that was a break from, <coughs> the, from the colonial world order, but it wasn't that. In fact, it was a sort of, uh, it was the kind of climax of the, of the imperial world order. And that's something that only becomes, that you can only see in such, uh, in such sort of exquisite situations as the Battle of Surabaya, yeah. you can only see it when you see it through the eyes of Indians or, or the eyes of the colonial world. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. All right, I could, I could go on for a long time, but um, I want to open it up to questions here. We've got about 15 minutes left, so raise your hands. We'll get you microphones, and I only ask that you keep it. We have one here in the front and one back there. Um, keep it short and make sure your last sentence ends with a question mark, please. <laughs> Right. Hi, uh, my name is Nishtha. I research on the 71 war, so yeah, it's in continuation. <laughs> yeah. uh, my question to the entire panel uh, is that uh, there was this binary that you also touched upon between the Indian National Army and the British Indian Army, and how one represented the national interest and the other the suppressors. So how is it, you know, uh, would you like to throw light on how the transformation, because now Indian Army is like this repository of nationalistic ideas, safeguards uh, of, of everything that is good in our country, and you know, which is largely true. And uh, uh, so how, how did that acceptance come about? Yeah, how did it become such a, I mean, it's still a political football today, and it was, <laughs> It was one back then as well. Is there, do you want to? Well, I, I think, I mean, throughout all of this, the binaries that are in the 1940s are overdrawn between, you know, nationalists on one side and army on the other. I think it's too black and white and too simple to set those two things a, a, alongside each other like yeah. that. Actually, there's a lot of movement. You know, you have families where there'll be two brothers and one will be in the INA and, and another in the army. And that, that, that happens. And yeah. you have um, people who are, you know, very sympathetic to, to nationalism in the army, and in, in fact, they even join because they think they're going to learn the technical skills or the, um, have the kind of opportunities to learn things that will help the free Indian state. So um, Nehru, of course, is a nationalist, but deeply sympathetic to the allies in many ways and, and anti-fascist to his core. So I think there's, um, there's not a kind of simple way of, of segregating these two out, and of course, later politics tends to just put them in boxes very kind of sim simplistically in a way, and the reality is it was much more fuzzy and gray and confused yes. than that. Yeah, yeah. Ne Nehru comes across uh, as, as the sort of paragon of, of certain, of, he's, he's immensely principled through, in, through all the decisions he makes in the war, but that also just leads him to have a very deep dilemma yeah. between participating and joining in, uh, in a global struggle against fascism, which he despised, and using this, key, this opportunity and this moment uh, to wrest um, independence from the British and to, and to fight imperialism, which he also despised. And I think that's, that's a perfect example because it shows, uh, I would say that 
our retrospective history doesn't necessarily want to reflect this, but it shows that in most cases, or in many, many cases, the divide between uh, what, was, what was nationalistic and what was loyal, what was insubordinate and what was servile, didn't lie between one person and another, but very frequently it ran between people, between, within the same person. Um, so it didn't run between the Indian National Army and the Indian Army. It ran through both of them. And that becomes more and more clear as you even begin to excavate the basic facts of the situation. Most of the Indian National Army, they, they were personnel who had been part of the Indian Army. They just happened to be abandoned on the wrong side of the advancing Japanese front line. And then they decided they would rather um, revise their allegiances and their positions and, and sort of uh, listen to one voice rather than the other, um, especially if the alternative was to be uh, take it driven to a Japanese uh, forced labor camp. Mm -hmm. right. In fact, I'll give you an example of, um, of this dichotomy that happens, because Noor Inayat Khan, she was uh, a secret agent, and she goes for this interview with the RAF, and they ask her point blank, there's this big panel sitting there, and they say, it's 1942, and you know, quit India movement, all the Congress leaders are in jail, and they ask her, you're in Indi of Indian origin, um, what would you, where would your allegiance lie in this war? And she gives them a very straight answer. She says, for this moment, I am on the British side, because the greater question and the greater good is to, get the, is to fight this war, to fight fascism. After the war, I'll, I'll be fighting for freedom. And she goes back and says, I've lost it. I'm not getting a promotion, which she actually does. So, and she's completely straightforward. So that's the, I think that's the step that a lot of people took. So, so. I, sorry, sorry oh, to, yeah, okay. to, 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 to not move on, but we have this amazingly schizoid idea of the Indian Army as though at the drop of, uh, of midnight on, in 1947, it became a nationalist army. Mm -hmm. And all the, all the battles it's fought then need to be celebrated. And that the, that a, that five minutes before that, it had been, I mean, of course, technically it had been, but in every way, the constituents of that army, they were the same people, and the people fighting were the same people. What, what really comes into perspective from understanding the army in the Second World War is, is that uh, at its best, uh, its nationalism, its ideology, uh, those weren't things that were integral to either its design or how it worked um, at all. So even today, what's best about the Indian Army is not that it is a repository for Indian nationalism. That's just a convenient thing for politicians to say. The best thing about it is that it's a professional army, and it's an army that understands the discipline of remaining under orders of the civilian government. Mm -hmm. And that is something that it has had, that it had in World War I, and that it had in World War II, yeah. and yeah. continued to have to the present day. And that's something that we should be valuing above uh, the idea that our army is full of, um, of, of nationalists. Okay. All right, I'm gonna, um, why don't we take three questions and then we'll, we'll answer them all at once. So right here at the end, we have somebody first. Good morning. Uh, during the course of war in Europe, there was a great mobilization of women uh, towards industries as their men and husbands, uh, children were actually serving for the war. So was it, a, there is a similar case in India uh, where uh, women also participated in the industries? Uh, as there was an industrial boom in our country at that point of time. And if it was not the case, then why, what prevented the women of India to do so? Yeah. Okay, so one, mm -hmm. and then we'll, oh, can, we, can we get the... Uh, okay, yeah, sorry, then there. at this end over here. Yeah. I was itching to ask since yesterday. <laughs> so, <laughs> yesterday it was Sunday matinee, so I was there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to Mr. Hazari, to English it, and uh, Yasmin did mention that in 1930s, Gandhi had the moral authority, which had eroded by 40s to, to a certain extent. So, do you think that partition, you know, Bua writes that partition became inevitable in the in the 40s, that Chori, after Chori Chora, when Gandhi actually rolled back on cooperation movement, ironically, that may have been the cusp. Where if we, that wouldn't have happened, then the horrible violence of partition could have been avoided. So, uh, in hindsight, uh, was that a place where partition could have been avoided. Okay, all right. Um, why don't we have the young man standing very tall back there. Yeah, hi. Uh, I missed a bit of the session, so I'm not sure if you've dis discussed this. Um, so uh, could you dwell on the reasons as to why uh, the same British Indian Army uh, manifested itself in such different forms in the two post-colonial states of Pakistan and India? 
were, were the factors uh, because of the nature of the army in the Punjab and, and in the other provinces of India before partition or, um, I mean, just if you could dwell on that a little bit. Okay, all right, and let me just grab one more question. Maybe somebody else threw up a, a hand here. Uh, I think the quick on, answer to that is that the, the, the army didn't, the armies, the respective national armies didn't manifest that differently. They, it was the civilian governments that manifested very differently. And especially the administrative apparatus that Pakistan got and India got that was very unequal. Yeah. Right. But uh, the armies met and continued to meet and their command continued to meet on very equal terms uh, and as equals and very sort of fraternally for many years after independence, I think. Yeah. Okay, all right, actually maybe um, why don't we answer these first. Do you well, want to take the Gandhi I'll, I'll question? I'll take the point about um, Gandhi in the 1940s. I mean, I think the, there's an intersection in the 1940s between two things. There's the, there's the power and the strength of the Congress movement but there's also the war. I mean, in 1939, Nehru says that our best hope for independence is something like 10 years, if we're lucky. And Churchill and the diehards and some of these people in the conservatives in Britain, you know, they really would like to hang on to India. For, for, they, they don't have any deadline in mind. I mean, they really, don't, they really feel they're fighting the Second World War to maintain empire. And so um, it is the acceleration of the war of all sorts of things which transform the possibility of independence, um, but in particular, the running down of the Indian civil service. The, there are men who have been working in the ICS, British men, who are just absolutely shattered and exhausted, and they're not prepared to stay. Um, they are desperate to leave by the end of the war. They've, they've been for six years, sometimes without leave. Uh, they, uh, the, the country has faced devastating famine. We haven't mentioned the famine, but of course, it's absolutely central. It's at the heart of the 1940s experience for India. And I think the, um, that combination of, of, of just kind of completely erodes any British moral authority. And the Americans have been on the scene as well, you know, pushing towards independence. So, so there's the, the fact that the Congress have these magnificent leaders and they have a, a viable kind of viable ideas about the constitutional settlement makes independence possible. But it's also the war which erodes the power of British power in, in India. I mean, they, they, it's not the same Raj in 1945 as it was in 1939. There's no, it's can be completely un, kind of unraveled, I think. And then, and then women in industries, I think we talked oh, about a bit. Oh, women in industries, yeah, there's, there's one of my favorite photos. Some of the propaganda photos are, are amazing for this time because they tell us things in pictures that we can't get in words always, but of women in- The in, cover of your book is hard well, to Well, the, yeah, the cover of the book is of two women in, in saris, but with air raid precaution um, gear and on tin and, and tin helmets. But there's also a photo of women in saris, you know, working in, in, fang, in tank factories, making the parts, spare parts for, ammuni for ammunition, for armaments, and, 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 and all of that. So there were many more women moving into industrial production, for sure, in, in, in India. And they were driving ambulances as well. So yeah. you have Princess uh, Indira Kapurthala. She is driving ambulances in London. And you have the Rens, the naval service. You have these women in the saris. That's yeah. another of my favorite photographs. And they are, um, they are driving ambulances, they're helping in the naval services. So, and, yeah. and laboring on roads and, and, and building sites, exactly. of course, uh, you know, manual labor on all the big roads going up into Burma. Right. They're hacking them out with their bare hands, you know, mm -hmm. and pickaxes. Yeah. All right, so it's been very efficient. So we have time for a couple more. Why don't we take in the pink shirt right here? Yeah. And then Thank you. Uh, my question is to Raghu Karnad. Uh, so how did the British Admiralty and the Field Marshals actually value the Indian divisions under them? in the sense that did they, did they feel they were more disposable or did they actually apply the same rules of um, uh, deployment and surrender to them as well? So uh, there are obviously, um, there are different viewpoints on this and the Britons are so good at writing biographies of these, of these, uh, of these commanders that, uh, that it's almost kind of a partisan, situ partisan situation. Uh, Montgomery was, was one way, and Auchinleck was another. <coughs> But I think there's a central per character who needs to come up here. Yasmin mentioned him earlier. This is Cloud Auchinleck, who had been both the commander of chief in India and in the, um, and in the Middle East. Um, he, was in he was commander of chief in India twice. He ought to be much better remembered and celebrated in this country. He was a, he was a, sort of, he was a champion of the Indian army and its modernization. He was an ardent defender of the interests of Indian troops and of India's uh, sort of strategic security, which was a very low priority for Churchill. Uh, um, I don't want to go on about, about this because one can go on about it. But, uh, 
Uh, Claude Auchinleck is, is probably the central figure along with Wavell and eventually Mount And, and Auchinleck, I mean, the, the last chapter of my book is Auchinleck trying to get a statue um, of Indian soldiers put up in London. Yes. You know, they, he, he campaigns to have something put up in Green Park and he writes some letters and mm -hmm. it, nothing comes of it. Nothing you know, it, 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 he's kind of ignored. Yeah. And it takes until uh, 2002, I think, to set up the memorial gates in London, which, which actually commemorate the, the role of imperial soldiers in the, in the First and Second World Wars in, um, in, in, in the British war oh, effort. Yeah. So um, he was trying to do that in 1948. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right, let me try and squeeze in one more question. Is the man in the purple back there with the hat who's had his hand up for a while? And then I think that might have to be the last one, but the authors will be signing books afterwards, you can ask them Hello. questions. Yeah, uh, my question is, uh, when the soldiers returned after the end of Second World War, so are there any uh, stories which talks about the dilemmas they faced with the freedom struggle and, and uh, or there was that belief that, they are, uh, that professionalism was very strong in them? I think um, there, were, there were many who didn't get pensions uh, depending on how, where they were in the ranks. You know, there were people who were bearers or cooks or, um, you know, in the non-combatant troop rank. You know, some of them went back to their villages and they didn't have, they hadn't served for long enough to even get a pension. They were injured and their stories kind of weren't, were known perhaps to their closest families but not, uh, not connected up to, to greater kind of... Uh, to greater regimental histories. Of course, it's very different for officers and to those who had a longer connection to the Indian Army. So I think it's the Army itself. I think one thing that's come across here is it was never a simple one um, monodimensional thing. It was very variegated, very very different depending on who you were, where you came from, yeah, I think, and, yes. and, and, and what what your role had been during the 19, 1940s, and whether you saw armed action or not as well. Absolutely, but uh, you, you you can make some broad generalizations and I think that it was the, the, that, that dilemma might have been especially keen among the officer ranks, among Indians um, get, receiving commissions as officers partly because they were more politicized to some extent, they were obviously better educated. They came from the same classes that were providing the leadership at the same time of the national movement. and. Uh, if you had been a member of the Indian Army, you know, if, if, if you were sort of a regular officer from pri pre prior to the war, then, uh, or if you belonged to the ranks and belonged to like a, uh, a decade-long tradition in which, in which you, your uh, is father after son from your family was signing up, the dilemma was probably uh, less, less keen. But I think for many, many uh, young people who were contemplating for the first time, and this is part of, partly why uh, partly why the, the three young men who I follow into the army are good cases to look at is because they would never have otherwise been in the army. So they had no conventional place in the army, but they had an option now. And so in the given, given the nature of that option, I think the dilemmas often were very key. And many thousands of people in that position did end up joining. And also the INA was was that dilemma writ large it didn't it didn't have much visibility actually i think in india until much later in the war but by the time the war ended the ina had appeared to sort of uh, to 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 provide an, an actual image of what uh, uh, of of the alternative to what the service of the regular indian army had been and to bring it to the present, actually, the Gurkhas in Britain are still fighting for their pensions and the right to stay and various other issues. Uh, so I think uh, there was a lot of dis discontent about pensions, definitely. All right, with that, I think we have to end it, but I want you to all to help me thank the writers for doing a service, bringing these stories out to the world. Thank you. Thank you.